It's a true crime podcast with two friends. I'm Ford. And I'm Vegas. Who hate each other. The only If, if I fell down the stairs, the only reason I would die is because I had a heart attack. That's the only reason. One it's, could help. Yeah, you wish. Truly a true crime podcast for the ages. She is an Oklahoma grandmother and she's facing a murder charge after her three-year-old granddaughter was found dead in a trash can like a prom night baby. A true crime podcast that tells it like it is. Allegedly. Well, it's obvious. No, it's le- it's, it's it's obvious. A- it could still be allegedly. But yeah, but you But it's say. obvious that he did it. Well, no, it's allegedly. It's allegedly obvious. No. Ford in Vegas, a true crime podcast for the ages with two friends who hate each other. It happens weekly on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. This is Jackie Moranti, host of Cause of Death on the Darkcast Network. On my show, we usually discuss war, death, destruction, and disease. And, as you can imagine, my tastes are a bit on the dark side. So when I shop for unique novelties and gifts, I always keep an eye out for something a little out of the ordinary. That's why I shop at Bat Wings and Butterflies. Bat Wings and Butterflies is an independent, creator-owned, and operated boutique of handmade knit creations that run the gamut from the wild side to the dark side. Here, you'll find knit toys and stuffies like baby baphomets, and giant tarantulas, household knits like blankets, doilies, and water pipe cozies. Every item is an original work of art, handmade with love by a talented artisan. Order your one-of-a-kind creations today. Find Bat Wings and Butterflies at batwingsandbutterflies.bigcartel.com or on Instagram at Batwings and Butterflies. My favorite product is the giant tarantula, the perfect thing for cold nights in the New Mexico desert. After all, eight arms are much better than just two. It's the perfect snuggle while listening to Cause of Death, available wherever you listen to podcasts and on the Darkcast Network. I'm Edward October creator host of October Pod, and we're both listening to Calls of Death on the Darkcast Network. Cause of Death 100 Seconds to Midnight portrays imagery of death, war, and destruction, and may not be suitable for children under the age of 13. Hello, and welcome to Cause of Death, 100 Seconds to Midnight. I'm your host, Jackie Moranti. A short bit of business to get out of the way before we start. I'm recording the Q&A episode along with this episode. It'll drop as a bonus next week in the off week. Next time, I'm going to be doing a 100 Seconds to Midnight episode, and that episode will address the global banking crisis. It's terrifying, but it's something we should all be paying attention to. Head over to my website at www.causeofdeath100sex.net to find ways to support the show. You can also interact with me there, or you can write me an email at Jackie at Cause of Death 100 Sex dot net. I'm going to let you in on a secret that not many people know. I love ratings and reviews only because I really like seeing what you all have to say, but it doesn't boost my show at all. The best way to support the show and keep it going is to share the love. Tell all your friends about it and have them listen. That is really how podcasters keep going. Downloads are what matter. Okay. Today, I'm going to talk about cholera. As usual, we'll begin with etiology and pathology. Cholera is the leading cause of death for people in the developing world, and it is so preventable. I'll continue to guilt trip you at the end of the show, but I really want this out there. 
If a patient with cholera goes untreated, they can die in a few hours. In untreated patients, the morbidity rate is anywhere between 50 to 70 percent. Vibrio cholerae has a very distinctive shape. It is a facultative, gram-negative, comma-shaped, oxidase-positive rod. The shape of the bacterium is the easiest way to identify it on gram stain under a microscope. These organisms are highly motile due to a single polar flagellum. V. cholerae is salt-tolerant and actually requires sodium for growth. It exists naturally in aquatic environments where it remains in a viable but non-culturable form. So, you ask, if it's in all these saltwater environments naturally, why aren't people dying of cholera all over the place? Well, here's the lowdown. If the bacterium is toxin-producing, then it will cause disease. Most of the V. cholerae isolates are not toxigenic, so they don't cause disease. The toxigenic strains harbor a filamentous bacteriophage that encodes for the cholera toxin. There are two serotypes of V. cholerae, O1 and O39. The O1 serotype is responsible for all recent outbreaks of cholera, and the O39 serotype is responsible for sporadic outbreaks in Asia. There is no etiologic difference between the two serotypes. If you're interested in the full mechanism of action for V. cholerae, there is a link in the show notes that will describe every bit of it. I'm kind of skimming it here because it becomes extremely technical. I love microbial physiology, but not everyone else does. A large dose of the bacterium is required to develop infectivity. Some underlying conditions that make people more susceptible to cholera include use of proton pump inhibitors or antihistamines, having type O blood, poor sanitation, overcrowding, prior vagotomy, and Heliobacter pylori infection. We'll talk about Heliobacter pylori later. Cholera has an incubation period of five hours to five days. So it comes on fast and furious. This disease causes high volume fluid loss with electrolyte derangements. This can quickly progress to hypovolemic shock and death without immediate medical care. Patients must undergo fluid replacement immediately. Cholera is spread through the oral fecal route. Yes, I want you to imagine that. Then go wash your hands with soap. I imagine that some of you will just take a full-on shower. Once the bacterium is ingested, it can colonize in the small intestine. The flagella allow the organism to swim through the mucus and invade the intestinal wall. Once there, toxigenic V. cholerae produces toxin-co-regulated pillus that attach to the gangliocide receptors in the mucosal wall. Cholera toxin is produced, and this leads to constitutive action of adenylate cyclase causing CAMP to increase intracellularly. Increased secretion of chloride, bicarbonate, sodium, and potassium results. This electrolyte secretion pulls water out of the intestinal cells osmotically, causing diarrhea. Fluid loss occurs from the duodenum because the colon is insensitive to the toxin. The enterotoxin is not invasive, so will remain localized. Symptoms can range from asymptomatic to profuse diarrhea. Commonly, diarrhea, abdominal discomfort, and vomiting are present. Severe cholera can be distinguished clinically from other illnesses by the rapid and profound fluid loss that a patient will suffer from. Stools are often described as having a rice water consistency and can be laced with bile or mucus. Adults can lose as much as one liter of fluid per hour. Symptoms of hypovolemia include dry oral mucosa, cool skin, and decreased skin turgor. Lactic acidosis can cause hyperventilation, and electrolyte abnormalities such as hypokalemia and hypocalcemia can be responsible for muscle weakness and cramping. 
Diagnosis can be based on clinical suspicion. Confirmatory tests consist of culturing selective media with a high pH that allows V. cholerae to multiply while suppressing the growth of normal gut flora. There are also rapid tests that can identify the O1 or O139 antigen. Cholera is endemic in countries where poor water sanitation and inadequate food hygiene exist. Treatment begins with fluid replacement. Then once the patient is stabilized, antibiotic therapy can begin. Cholera is exhibiting antibiotic resistance, so cocktails of several drugs could be necessary for treatment. Now, if you happen to find yourself with cholera in a zombie apocalypse, the emergency recipe for electrolyte replacement is one liter of water mixed with six teaspoons of sugar and a teaspoon of salt. This is not a replacement for IV fluid therapy, but it might keep you from dying on your way to the hospital. The first link in the show notes under the history of cholera is a fantastic TEDx video about the disease and its spread. It's very short, but very worth watching. The four Fs are addressed so nicely in that video. Just go give it a quick review. Just so that we remember the four Fs, I'll run over them again. They are feces, flies, fingers, and fomites. Okay, so to prevent cholera, water should be boiled for 20 minutes before use. Chlorine additives and filtration systems should also be used. Proper hand washing is essential. Hands should be washed in clean water, so use the water that has previously been treated to wash hands and use soap. No hand sanitizer. Soap. All raw foods should be washed and peeled before cooking and cook it thoroughly. Yes, wash bananas before you peel them. Keep the food covered and away from flies. Flies carry cholera on their bodies after landing in infected feces. And speaking of feces, in areas without running water, latrines should be dug at least 30 meters away from any water source. For those traveling to endemic areas, a vaccine is available. However, precautions should still be taken. Drink only bottled water. Make sure all food is washed and cooked properly. And wash those hands with soap. Surveillance by various health organizations around the world is in place for cholera outbreaks. Once upon a time, the mortality rate of cholera ranged anywhere from 50 to 70 percent. In untreated cases, this is still true. However, since the importance of hydration therapy as a treatment has come to the forefront, the mortality rate has dropped to about 5 percent in those patients who are treated. Okay. So let's talk about history. There have been seven major cholera pandemics throughout history. But even before the pandemics began, cholera was known as a disease that could kill someone in less than eight hours. Cholera was described in Chinese writings during the first century. Wang and Wu Lin Te would also write about cholera. Hippocrates and Galen also described an illness similar to cholera. Several others would consider it the worst epidemic disease in ancient history. Cholera originated in India. An endemic pocket existed on the delta of the Ganges River. Several Hindu pilgrimages and many festivals were held in this area. These festivities attracted large crowds that were exposed to cholera, and of course, they took it home with them when they left. Several outbreaks were correlated with holy days even before the disease was known as Vibrio cholerae. Some descriptions of the disease date as far back as 2,500 years ago in India. Sanskrit scriptures from the 5th century also detail the spread of the disease. A temple honoring Ula Bibi, the goddess of cholera, has stood in Calcutta since the end of the 19th century. The Portuguese arrived in India in 1498, and various Europeans documented the existence of cholera after the disease began to spread around the world. 
Gaspar Correa, a Portuguese historian, wrote of a sickness that he called Morixi in his book Legendary India. His description included vomiting, diarrhea, cramping, and death by the end of the day. Spring of 1503 saw cholera in the sovereign Calcutta army. 20,000 men were stricken and many died in eight hours or less. Garcia de Orta published Conversations on Simples and Drugs and Medical Materials from India in 1563. This volume contained the first modern description of cholera. In 1585, an unknown Frenchman noted that mort de chien, or a dog's death, was making the rounds once again in India. In 1629, a physician with the Dutch East India Trade Company reported that the general governor of Batavia, which is now Jakarta, Indonesia, had died of cholera. Colonial presence in India by the French and the English gives us several more accounts of cholera outbreaks in the region. In 1683, Goa sustained another outbreak that killed several hundred people, and Scotsman James Lind recorded an outbreak in 1760. Another account documented an epidemic that lasted from 1768 to 1771. This scourge took the lives of approximately 60,000 people and had included the areas of Burma and Malaysia in 1770. During 1781 and 1782, cholera again struck Calcutta, and in 1783, it had moved to the holy city of Hardwar during a pilgrimage. 20,000 worshippers died in eight days. During this time, the Maranthan armies were fighting for control of Tipu Sahib. Many soldiers died, including the Sultan of Mysore. During 1786 and 1787, several other outbreaks were documented in India. Then came the first pandemic. From 1817 to 1824, cholera became one of the most feared diseases of the time. This pandemic began in the Ganges Delta, specifically in Jasore, India. The source was contaminated rice. It followed trade routes established by Europeans through most of India, modern-day Myanmar, and modern-day Sri Lanka. By 1820, the disease had spread to Thailand. The death toll on the island of Java was 100,000 people. The Philippines and Indonesia also suffered severe losses of life. From Thailand and Indonesia, cholera made its way to China in 1820 and Japan in 1822. In 1821, British troops traveling from India to Oman brought cholera with them to the Persian Gulf. Then it traveled into European territory, where it landed in modern-day Turkey, Syria, and southern Russia. This pandemic ended between 1823 and 1824 likely due to a severe winter, which may have killed the bacteria that had been living in the water supplies. The second pandemic began in 1829. This one is also thought to have begun in India and moved along the trade and military routes to Eastern and Central Asia and the Middle East. By the fall of 1830, the disease had hitched a ride to Moscow. Spread slowed down during the winter of the following year, but picked up again during the spring of 1831. Cholera made its way to Finland and Poland, then Hungary and Germany. It rapidly spread through Europe and reached Great Britain via the port of Sunderland in late 1831, then struck London in 1832. Controversy between whether cholera was spread from human to human or through environmental factors raged. Political debates were held between conservatives, who were contagionists, and liberals, who were considered anti-contagionists, on matters of public health and free trade. Contagionists believed that cholera was spread from human to human, while anti-contagionists believed that there was something in the environment that caused the disease. Neither one of them were wrong. Governments strengthened public health measures since the problems of sanitation hadn't been addressed by private companies. Quarantines were implemented. People complained of rights violations. 
and the disease spread quickly through the city, killing people as it went. Fear generated a distrust of doctors and the government. The press was reporting that more people were dying in hospitals than in their homes. People began to believe that hospitals were purposely killing people so that they could use the bodies for dissection. Riots broke out. Now, it's important to remember that none of this is new, right? Whenever there is a public health crisis, media can make or break an outcome. Fear is a powerful thing, and if there are inaccuracies in information, fear will grip communities and people will take to the streets. In Moscow, a German chemist, R. Hermann, began to believe that water should be injected into the veins of patients to combat dehydration. William Brooke O'Shaughnessy agreed. He reported in The Lancet during 1881 that on the basis of his studies, quote, I would not hesitate to inject some ounces of warm water into the veins. I would also, without apprehension, dissolve in that water the mild innocuous salts which nature herself is accustomed to combine with the human blood and which in cholera are deficient. End quote. Thomas Latta would also follow this example in 1832 in Scotland with surprisingly positive results. The first IV fluid replacement was born. Not many doctors would pick up on IV fluid therapy, though. The common treatment for cholera at the time consisted of enemas, mercurous chloride, which also purged the colon, gastric washing, that sounds pleasant, bloodletting, opium, brandy, and the plugging of the anus to prevent fluid from escaping. So you give a patient an enema and a butt plug. That seems counterintuitive. And it was. Actually, the death toll was extremely high during the second pandemic. In 1832, cholera arrived in the Americas. June of that year saw 1,000 deaths in Quebec. Then it spread along the St. Lawrence River and its tributaries. Cholera appeared in the U.S. around the same year. It began in New York and Philadelphia and made its way across the country. New Orleans was the hardest hit in the U.S. 5,000 people died of cholera during the pandemic. It reached Latin America and Cuba in 1833. This pandemic would die out, then suddenly reemerge throughout the world until 1851 when it subsided. The third pandemic began in 1852 and lasted until 1859. This one was the deadliest. It began in India and spread to Persia, then Europe, and then the U.S. It continued around the rest of the world from there. It devastated Asia, Europe, North America, and Africa. 23,000 people succumbed to the disease in Great Britain alone during 1854. That was the worst year for cholera. In 1852, Filippo Pinsini identified the cholera bacterium for the first time. Yes, it was found twice. Pansini called it cholerogenic vibrios. He didn't make his find very well known, nor did he publish it. So later, when Robert Koch studied the bacterium, Koch would be credited with the find, and it's doubtful that Koch even knew Pansini had found vibrio cholerae before. It was in that year that John Snow mapped the incidences of cholera and tracked them to the Broad Street Pump in London. I told the story of John Snow in Season 2 when I did the case study in epidemiology. So go back and listen to that. It's a fascinating story. Cholera is very rich in history, so there are more stories to tell. The fourth and fifth pandemics were much less severe than the previous ones. The fourth pandemic started in 1863 and lasted until 1875. This pandemic began in the Bengal region. Muslim pilgrims visiting Mecca took the disease home to the Middle East, and it spread from there. 
During this pandemic, cholera reared its ugly head all over the world again, with the worst of it occurring in Hungary between 1872 and 1873. That year, 190,000 Hungarians died of the disease. The fifth pandemic began in 1881 and lasted through 1896. This one also began in India and spread from there. Again, this pandemic wasn't quite as severe as the first three, but Hamburg lost 1.5% of its population due to cholera in 1892. During the fifth pandemic, the U.S. and Great Britain were fairly safe. Both countries had taken great strides to improve water quality, sanitation, and quarantine measures. In 1883, Robert Koch, the founder of modern microbiology, went to Egypt and Calcutta to study cholera. He developed a technique that allowed him to grow and describe the bacterium. Then he proved that the presence of V. cholera in the intestines of patients caused cholera. Koch also firmly connected the role water played in the transmission of cholera, and he found out that people who survived cholera would have some natural immunity to the disease for a period of time afterward. The first cholera vaccine was developed in 1885 and was used to mass vaccinate the people of Spain. This vaccine used whole killed bacteria. The effects were weak, though, and the vaccine didn't last very long. So, research continued. Sashenko and Sablotny developed the first oral vaccine in 1893. I think this was an accident. Totally. Somehow, they managed to ingest V. cholerae that had been heat-killed. Maybe they did it on purpose. I don't know. Although they remained cholera-free even after challenge, Questions remained about practicality since several high doses were required to reach immunity. The sixth pandemic lasted from 1899 to 1923. This pandemic began in India, where over 800,000 people died of the disease. During the beginning of the 20th century, Sir Leonard Rogers was studying cholera in Calcutta at the medical college. He developed a replacement fluid that contained a much higher salt content than had previously been used. And this took the mortality rate down by half, from 60% to 30%. Andrew Sellards was an American physician in Manila. He suggested adding sodium bicarbonate along with sodium chloride to IV solutions. This brought the mortality rate to 20%. Cholera biotype l was first described in 1905 by German physician E. Gottschlich. He was working at a quarantine station in the city of l in the Sinai Desert that had been established to study cholera in victims who were returning from pilgrimages to Mecca. Western Europe and North America had made such advances in public health and sanitation that they were virtually untouched by the pandemic. But India, Russia, the Middle East, and North Africa suffered severe losses. A half a million people died in India alone during 1918 and 1919. During the 1920s and 1930s, field trials were conducted in India using Billa vaccine. This was a tablet that contained 70 billion dried V. cholerae organisms. Three doses were given on three consecutive days. It did provide some protection against cholera, but it was proven to be inferior to other vaccines that had been developed previously. Later, cost was a factor in the decision to abandon oral vaccines. At the time, mass manufacturing was very expensive. In 1958, there was another advance in cholera treatment. Robert A. Phillips, a U.S. Navy physician, added glucose to the solution that had previously been developed. This took the mortality rate down to 1%. We are now in the seventh cholera pandemic. This one began in Indonesia in 1961 and spread across India, Russia, Asia, and the Middle East. 
It reached Africa in 1971. During 1990, more than 90% of all cholera cases reported came from the African continent. In 1968, an oral rehydration solution was developed. This eliminated the need for IVs and could easily be administered to children. During the 1980s, oral vaccines were again being developed. Increased understanding of the connection between intestinal immunity and cholera evolved, giving rise to better oral vaccines. 1991 saw cholera in Peru. The disease had been absent in South America for over 100 years. 3,000 Peruvians died in the first year of the outbreak. Then it spread to Ecuador, Colombia, Brazil, and Chile. It made its final stop in Central America and Mexico. V. cholerae 0139 was identified in 1992 during an outbreak on the eastern coast of India. The current pandemic has affected 120 countries, most of them in the developing world. An outbreak in Zimbabwe from 2008 to 2009 saw 97,000 affected and 4,200 die. The outbreak after the earthquake in Haiti from 2010 to 2011 affected more than 500,000 people. In 2017, outbreaks in Somalia and Yemen saw another half million people affected and 2,000 dead. Today, there are four oral vaccines available against cholera. They are only given to people who are traveling to areas where cholera is endemic. Annually, about 4 million cases of cholera are reported worldwide. About 140,000 people die of cholera every year, and most of these are children. 1.8 million people worldwide obtain their drinking water from sources that are contaminated with human feces. There are places in the developing world where sanitation and water filtration simply don't exist. Cholera is endemic in approximately 50 nations, mostly in Asia and Africa. Outbreaks generally occur during the rainy season. Outbreaks can also occur in the rest of the world, particularly in Central and South America. Cholera has been introduced to new regions where proper sanitation and good water hygiene have collapsed. Think about New Orleans after Katrina or Flint, Michigan. I'm going to end this episode with a couple of stories. Way back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth and I was a baby lab tech doing my first internship, I worked in a reference lab in Texas. This was during my associate's degree in medical laboratory technology. The gal I was working with was the manager of the micro lab. I could hard pass on all the other stuff, but I loved me some micro, so I was pretty excited to get to do an internship in the micro lab. Well, this gal was in over her head a little. I don't think she had enough experience to actually manage that part of the lab. Other parts were easier, but micro is hard. It takes precision and strong attention to detail. Anyway, I went into the lab one day and we had an unidentified sample from a patient's ear. We ran all the common plates and did PCR on the sample. We did have a machine that did PCR, but it was a bit iffy, so the plates would tell the tale in about 24 to 48 hours. The PCR came back as cholera. Well, cholera doesn't really manifest in the ear. And since we were a reference lab, we didn't know a lot about the patient's history or anything, so we just had to wait on the plates. The plates confirmed cholera. We reported that to the doctor after PCR and again after confirmation. Now, how this guy got cholera in his ear, we'll never know. But there we were with cholera. So, here's the deal. Cholera is a reportable disease in the U.S. and the rest of the world, really. If you find it, you have to report it directly to the CDC. You don't wait. At that time, in 2005, 
it was still endemic and considered part of the seventh pandemic. So it was a big deal. And it became a really big deal for the lab. The CDC came down on them hard. The manager got in a lot of trouble for that one. I don't believe she got fired, but she sure got a stern talking to. Okay, now on to a funny story about that same reference lab and the same lab manager. About a week later, we were inoculating plates. I can't remember which ones we were doing or whether the pattern was the tree or the squiggle, but suffice to say that we had a patient with both stool and urine samples to plate, and we were plating everything. So when we were finished, we had to sterilize the loops we were using. This was back in the day before disposable loops were really popular. They were a thing, but most labs were too cheap to use them, so we were stuck with metal loops. Well, generally, all you did to sterilize a loop was run it through a flame a few times until it got a little red, then you let it cool and moved on to the next set of plates. She said it was better to pour 70% isopropyl alcohol over the loop and then burn it. So that's what she did. She poured the alcohol on it and lit a match to the loop and dropped the match. Now, it's a good thing that this was done over a sink because the match hit the bottom of the sink and caught the loop and the sink on fire. Flames shot up to the bottom of the cabinet. She had no idea what was happening, so she yelled, Oh, shit, what do we do? And I reached over and turned the water on and doused the flames. The fire went out. From then on, I called her Sparky. I don't know if she got fired over that one, but I promised that we would keep that just between us, and I wouldn't tell a soul. The problem with working in labs is that there are cameras everywhere, so I'm pretty sure someone somewhere saw what was happening with that. Okay, I had a couple of interesting questions from my friend Claire. Shout out, Claire! Her mother had gotten COVID and received treatment with a new antiviral that's been approved for emergency use. The drug is called malapiravir. It's a great drug. You can take it for three days and all the symptoms go away. Yay! The problem is that many patients who have taken the drug are experiencing rebound infections. They may or may not test negative immediately after taking the drug, but they'll test positive again a few days later. They will be asymptomatic, but they will still test positive. It's happening quite a bit with this drug. Claire's question was, is my mom actually positive or is this a false positive? Fair question. Well, I dug around and asked some people I know who are working with the drug, and I looked it up on the FDA website, and I channeled my inner scientist. I found a white paper or two on the drug, so I did my usual research on the thing. And the answer I came up with was, I don't know. No one seemed to know if this was an actual infection or a false positive. False negatives are common with the rapid COVID test, so the assumption is is that if you test positive, you are indeed positive. Sometimes patients who take this drug test positive for up to three weeks after the infection is cleared. Okay, so that was the word on the street a couple of weeks ago. I haven't researched it any further since other things came up, like this episode. But if anyone out there has any more information on this, feel free to contact me. I know I have some researchers listening. So there you go. I don't know everything. My best advice was to tell her mom to remain in quarantine and test again before going out without a mask. Allison asked a phenomenal question. With New York City reporting that polio is in the wastewater, at what point should we be worried about it? Well, the truth of the matter is is that we should have been worried about polio long before it was found in New York. I talk about polio in the third season, and it's nothing to mess with. I was actually going to mention in any one of my episodes that it's worth asking your doctor about being vaccinated for polio again, 
especially if you haven't been vaccinated in the last 10 years. The immunity from vaccines wanes. So not only are we facing the fact that people aren't vaccinating their children, but we've also got an older population of people who think that vaccines that they got 50 years ago are still good. Nothing is one and done. And with a new emergence of the disease in the U.S., it's worth just going in and asking about vaccines. Might as well mention monkeypox while you're at it. There's a vaccine for that. And don't let them tell you that it only hits this or that population of people. We all know that's not true. I also suggest that people get a DTAP if they haven't had one in the last 10 years and consider an update on the MMR as well. It sounds like a lot, but it's better to be protected before there's an outbreak than to be wondering what to do after you have the disease. Okay, so that's it for today. Next time you'll hear my voice telling all kinds of goofy stories about my dog, my life, and I'll answer questions that you were also gracious to send me. Until then, have a great week, and thank you so much for listening to Cause of Death, 100 Seconds to Midnight.